the Sixers have clinched the playoff spot for the first time since 2012. The significance of that and what it means moving forward. Michael Kasky Blomain covers the Sixers for 97.3 ESPN.com. He joins us t- right now, and uh, tonight the Sixers take on the Nuggets, but they've already clinched, Michael. They are in. So is this season to you a success? Absolutely, Mike. Uh, you know, I did not necessarily expect a uh, you know a playoff first this season. I thought that it was a possibility. I thought that they would be fighting for you know the eighth spot, the seventh spot. The fact that they are you know in position not only to make the playoffs comfortably before it even hits April, but the fact that they are you know in position to potentially have home court advantage in the first round and get as high as the three seed is uh you know, beyond even my highest ex- expectations for the season. So regardless of what happens in this in the playoffs, if they win a series or not, in my book at least, um, yes, the season has, has absolutely been a success. For the uh, what what has um, what has happened this year? What's something that has been a surprise that you didn't expect that to put them in position to uh, you know be not only a playoff team but potentially have a home game or a home uh, you know host a series at home. I think the development and the cohesion has just occurred at a faster rate than I, than I really expected, Mike. I mean, you put a guy like Ben Simmons, who's who's never played before, in charge of the point guard duties. He has a ball in his hands so much. Your go-to guy is a player that's only played 31 career games with heavy restrictions before this season. Bunch of guys that never played together, second-year players, and some vets that, you know, really had never played together before. The fact that they had, you know, obviously we had talked about they had struggles early. Um, lost some games they shouldn't have lost, still deal with turnover issues. But, you know, the fact that they have kind of found this rotation now, once with the additions of Marco and Irsan, uh, you know, a solid nine-man group, ten-man group that they really like. And just how good Ben has been, how good Joel has been, and, and Dario, too. Uh, I don't want to forget him. Really, the development of those three guys, I think, has been key. Uh, Michael Kasky Blomain is with us uh, at the Real Mike KB on Twitter. Um, you know, the one thing – a lot of people looked at this Sixers team and thought, as you said, ah, maybe they just get in. Maybe they're about 40, 42 wins. They get in as the 7-8 seed. But I guess the, the now that they are where they are, what are your expectations? Have they changed about if they get in, what are you expecting? Yeah, it's a, they've absolutely changed, Mike. Now uh, they're in position. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're all thinking that depending on the matchup and health, of course, that they could not only get into these playoffs, but they could win a series. Um, you know, you're looking at potentially if things stay the way they are, maybe a first-round matchup with the likes of the Pacers, the Wizards, or, you know, if there's a little bit shuffle, the Bucks, the Heat. Any of those teams in the first round, I think you're – you know, if you're not saying the Sixers are going to win, you're at least giving them a very, a very solid chance to do that. So, I mean, I think it's to the point where at first earlier this season we would have been, you know, we were excited about the potential of a playoff first, and they've just exceeded expectations to the point that now, you know, people are, are talking about them as a team that could potentially really make some noise and, and advance in the, in the postseason. Michael, is there a better passer of the basketball in the NBA right now than Ben Simmons? His court vision, uh, some of the assists that he had uh, over the weekend on Saturday night and that win over the Timberwolves where you just go, oh, my God. Pete, I mean, the list of passers in the league better than Ben, it's it's very slim, if any. Maybe maybe LeBron, you know, maybe at his best, Russ, when he's in the zone. But Ben, for a rookie, the vision, and not only that, but just the IQ and the kind of like the basketball experience to know – where guys are going to be to be able to hit them in stride, to be able to orchestrate fast breaks the way he does and get guys, you know, not only opportunities, but wide open looks from the perimeter for layups. He, uh, he just, he displays a mastery out on the floor that, you know, we thought we, I think a lot of us hoped that he would get to that level, but to really to see where he's at and he's already, you know, he's clearly much more comfortable now than he was earlier on in the season. You could see it in his play. He can kind of just, lets the game come to him. He controls the floor without even necessarily having to score just by, you know, really pushing the tempo, hitting the glass, finding guys for assists. It's really it's really incredible. And I think uh, the expectations, at least for me personally, for what 
Ben could be throughout his career have uh, have certainly gone up over the course of the season and watching him develop so fast already. And all the opposing coaches, they all talk about his passing ability when they're talking about like what the scouting report is going into the game. It's almost like I happen to be wearing a Nebraska shirt today, and back in the day, everybody knew what Nebraska was going to do. They are going to play option football, but nobody could stop him. Everybody knows what Ben Simmons is going to do, but they haven't been able to find a way to slow this guy down. Right, Pete, and that's what's so impressive. Everyone, you know, people like to point to the fact that he still, you know, he still does not have a, a consistent jump shot. And even with teams knowing that and being able to, you know, sag off of him or pack the paint and not necessarily guard him out to the three-point line, even with the teams knowing that, they still can't stop him from virtually, you know, basically just doing whatever he wants, finding, you know, all of his teammates for, you know, numerous buckets and, and really just controlling the game. So, I mean, the fact that you really can't prepare for what he's going to do because he can hurt you in so many different ways. It's just, uh, I think his development is something that's made the Sixers team potentially so dangerous going into the postseason. Because like you said, I mean, you could you could game plan for him. You could try to minimize his impact. But once he gets out there, he seems to be able to find new ways to kind of create and get things done every night. And the Sixers, uh, it's not just Simmons that shares the basketball. Uh, the Their assist-to-made basket ratio, and when they have 20-plus assists or sometimes 30-plus assists, the other night I think they had 30 assists to 42 made baskets. It's, uh, the, that comes from Brett Brown, right, the style of basketball that he wants them to play. 100%, Pete. That's been uh, something that Brett has been instilling into this team since, you know, well before they were in playoff contention over the past few years. He is uh, – you know, emphasize getting out, uh, you know, pace and space, moving the ball, and just, you know, passing and, and making sure to, you know, m- make the right pass, give the, the next guy a, a better look. And that's something that, you know, they've been practicing over recent years, but it's, it's finally been reflected on the floor with the talent that this team has. You can really see they move the ball about as much as anyone in the league. They get as many assists as a team as anyone in the league. And that style of play just makes them, you know, really difficult to defend. They have guys, you know, out there at all times, usually that can either, uh, you know, penetrate or shoot from the outside. And that unselfish nature is just, uh, you know, it permeates throughout the team. You can see it. They all play in an unselfish manner, and it makes them, you know, very difficult to defend. Now, the other night, Michael, the Sixers get up on the Timberwolves so big, they pull all the starters. The second unit goes in, and a lot of the backups go in. And it got so close, they actually had to put the starters back in. Does that give you pause? Does that does that worry you? Or because or, we had Tom McGinnis on, he said it was more just the backups. Usually they go in, but they don't go in that long. It, it was a, a testament. He thought more to the number of minutes that they were expecting the backups to play. Yeah, I would agree with Tom on that. It was a little bit disheartening to see that, especially after such a dominating performance from you know from the team over three quarters. Uh, you would obviously like for them to be able to close the close the deal there, but it, it was a, a substantial amount of time. They had, you know, Furkan Korkmaz in at the very beginning of the fourth who was barely, you know, has any NBA experience. And I absolutely understand what Brett was trying to do there in that situation. You know, rest the guys as much as you can for the playoffs and try to get, you know, the reserves some real game experience. Unfortunately, it, uh, you know, it didn't work out that game. And Ben uh, particularly was pretty upset with that after the game he made it uh you know, he made it pretty clear to us down in the locker room that he was, you know, I think he used the word annoyed. It was annoying to have to go back in the game because the guys didn't handle business. But, uh, you know, that's going to happen once in a while, especially, you know, the second unit relies so heavily now on two guys that were, you know, recent additions that weren't even on this team in January and Marco and Irsan. So, uh, you know, I think that there'll be up and downs like that. But by and large, the bench has done, you know, a really solid job. It, it, it's noticeably better than it was the first half of the season with those two guys. So as long as that's not a trend where the bench isn't really able to, uh, you know, take care of business, I don't think it, it's that concerning. Hey, Michael, I want to go back to 2012. I asked this question to, to uh, Tom McGinnis, and he gave me an interesting answer. I'd like to hear what yours is. You know, they made the playoffs and beat the Bulls and made it to the game seven against the Celtics. They blew that team up. That's when they made the Bynum trade. Their reasoning was they thought that team really hit the ceiling. That was as far as they felt that team was going to go. So they took a swing in the opposite direction. They went for an established star player, Andrew Bynum. It didn't work out. I don't criticize them for that. They took a swing, and they missed. So I give them credit for trying. Then... Collins is out, Thorne is out, they bring in Sam Hinkie. They went the opposite direction. 
My question for you is, going back to 2012, did you think that they made the right decision in that that team had hit its ceiling? Did you want to see that team take more swings as constructed? No, I definitely agree with Tom. I certainly think that team hit its ceiling. At that point, you know, they, they got past the, the Bulls in that first round after Rose got injured. And, you know, you have, you have pieces in place. And at that point, once you go for Bynum, it doesn't work out. He, he's injured. You're, you know, you're without Iguodala. At that point, there's really nothing you can do. You're, you know, you're stuck with guys. And obviously that's what, you know, started the whole process. But I definitely agree. I think that that team – Almost overperformed that season under Doug. You had Lou Williams was the, te- the team's leading scorer coming in off the bench and getting buckets, and it was a lot of guys that, that were solid. But you know, you didn't have you didn't have the feeling that you have with this Sixers team. At least I personally didn't, as as a fan and someone that, that covered the team back then. Still, you didn't have the feeling that they could truly compete and necessarily do it that season and moving forward. Whereas this year with these, these guys, you know, this is the first playoff appearance for Ben and Joel. And we don't have the feeling like, all right, this team is kind of outperforming and, and it's a one-and-done thing. This is the beginning of what we all think and hope to be a sustained success where a team only gets better. And that's not a feeling you got from that team. That was a team of you know veterans that are kind of maxed out. You go all in on buying them and it fails. And at that point, you know, I, I think a lot of us feel kind of lucky that it happened that way because it, you know, it led to the process. But all in all, I don't think you can really fault the, you know, anyone for going all in in that situation. Right. I, 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 somebody like if the team as constructed in – oh, we just lost uh, Michael there. He was there and then he was The team that was constructed back in 2012, if they had won 45 games, right? Yeah. You would feel differently about their 45 wins than you would this team's 45 wins. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. Because the team that that, that team was more established and had named players on it, and, they, and that team not necessarily was. It, you didn't have the build towards something. The, the 45, if they end up 45, 48, whatever wins they end up with in this season, they're building towards something for them to get. They're on an upward trend. That would be what I think would be the difference. All right, let's bring Michael back in. And we were just discussing while you were gone, Mike, mysteriously dropping off the line there. Um, <laughs> the, the 2012 team, if they had 45 wins and if this team had 45 wins, you would feel differently about this team winning 45 as opposed to that team winning 45. A hundred percent, Mike. That's kind of what I was getting at before. As you said, I mysteriously dropped off the line. Uh, it's just a different feeling. This is something – it's organic and you feel it's sustainable and something that can be legitimate and where you could actually, you know, you could feel that this, this team's building to something. Whereas, you know, with that team, you felt like it was a talented group of, of, you know, players that were together, but you, you know, I don't think anyone really felt that even after beating the bulls or, you know, going toe to toe with Boston, that that was a team that that year was going to win or after that, that you could say, okay, well, we did, this is a, you know, that was a run to build on. I don't think, obviously, Doug and Rod didn't view it that way by, you know, going all in and getting by them. And I don't think a lot of the fans viewed it that way, whereas this year, I think a lot of us are viewing it as the first year of what will be sustained success for a team that has, you know, a legitimate chance to actually go deep and make some noise rather than kind of just outpunch themselves and catch some teams by surprise. What do you think, um... I mean, because, like, look, there's a lot of debate back and forth. In fact, my Twitter line is blowing up right now with debates on Hanky still. He's this, he's that, he was this, you're wrong. But people are going to fight about this forever. But is there a defining moment of luck or is there a defining moment of Hanky made a great decision or Colangelo made a great decision? Is there kind of something that – turned the turnstiles one way uh, that made us feel or made you feel that this thing is moving in the right direction? And when was that? Because there's a lot of people that said, well, it took too long. Why is it taking so long? It shouldn't take so long. Uh, I would say that basically four seasons is is pretty quick turnaround, in, in my opinion anyway, which is probably delayed by the fact that Joel was injured. Although, because Joel was injured, you ended up with Ben Simmons. If Joel's not if Joel plays, you probably don't get Simmons. 
Right. Uh, that's a great point. And, and four years, you know, for it's not a long time to establish what the Sixers have established. You know, a lot of the teams that were kind of on the same timeline in, in that, that phase where a lot of the national media was saying, you know, these teams are rebuilding the right way or whatnot are no further along and actually would have, would certainly trade what they have going on right now for the core that the Sixers have built in, in that same amount of time. But, uh, you know, I like to go back to the, the 2014 draft, Mike, uh, as really – uh, I, I, not necessarily the turning point, but I think that night was just so crucial and representative of the entire process. I mean, that's a, that's a draft that was, you know, really highly hyped. It actually hasn't quite lived up to that hype, but coming into it, you know, you were looking, people were really high on Andrew Wiggins, Jabari Parker, Aaron Gordon. Uh, you know, there was a lot of players in that draft. Marcus Smart, they were getting a lot of buzz, and obviously Joel. And you have the Sixers who have this fan base and obviously the, the process and, and Sam takes two guys that he knows are not going to play for at least one season, uh, you know, delaying any any potential uh, improvement from the team. You're, you know, pushing everything back a year. And at that point, you know, a lot of people looked at that as as, as poor. And obviously now we know with, with the, you know, hindsight and looking at that ended up being Joel, who is, you know, a superstar and potentially, you know, a, a foundational piece of, of a championship team. And Dario, who is, you know, a potential all-star himself and has been great for the team. And because of that delay, you know, not only do we have those guys now, kind of like you alluded to, they ended up, I mean, unfortunately, we took Okafor at 15, but they were able to continue the process of, you know, getting some of these assets, testing out some other guys and bulking up. You know, Robert Covington was discovered during that time. TJ came out in 2015. And then we drafted Ben in 2016. So it kind of all comes full circle. But that 2014 draft, if it had been, you know, if Joel had been not been able to play or Dario never came over or what have you, that would be pointed at as, you know, a big failure of Sam Hinkie and, be, you know, look, he, he took these risks, it didn't pay off. But instead, it, to me at least, it's quite the opposite. He, that, you know, he showed patience, he showed foresight, and now we're kind of reaping the dividends of the, that move still and for the future. Right, I, and I think I agree with you that 2014 was kind of a defining moment because – Teams were passing on Embiid because it, it kind of exemplifies why the Sixers. I don't. I mean, why it's working is because they were willing to be patient. The teams in front of them weren't willing to wait for Joel because they figured he can't help us now. So we're going to try to get someone to help us now. The Sixers were willing to wait, and that same line of thinking led them to the Dario trade where they said, look, I don't care if this guy comes and plays now. We're just going to stockpile the player that we think is the best. And whether he plays with us now or two years down the road doesn't matter to us. And I think that, as Tom McGinnis said earlier, the long-term lens that they had has put them in this position. Because if they – Specifically Orlando, too, was the team that when they played Orlando the other night and then you and I talked about it on the air here about – the different processes that the Sixers took versus Orlando trying to speed up the process and the way they went versus the way the Sixers went. And that's in that same draft, too. Orlando is such a pivotal team yeah. that they dealt with in that year. In but the if, if the draft. Sixers deem that we want to start this thing moving, maybe they take Aaron Gordon. Maybe they take – remember Dante Exum's name was coming up because he was from Australia. Uh, maybe they went out and got – uh, Julius Randle because he was a more you know polished player. The fact that they were not in a rush and they take Embiid there really is the turning point. A hundred percent, Mike. Sam, uh, you know the, the the popular saying about him is that he had the longest view in the room, and uh, you know it was a hundred percent on display on that draft night. He caught a lot of slack immediately afterwards. I remember the articles that came out right after the draft for that exact reason because. Like you said, there was guys that were drafted right after him that were going to play that could have had had an immediate impact, and people were looking for you know a quicker turnaround to the Sixers. You know, struggles they had already drafted Nerlens the year before. They thought, okay, we have a big guy. Why are you taking another injured big guy? Same with Dario Saric. You know, there was other players that people would have liked to see, but uh, you know, Sam in that situation had you know the longer view in mind, and it worked on, on both picks and that uh like you said i think obviously that joel pick teams passing on him because he was injured uh there's no one in that 2014 draft obviously that you would rather have right now than joel Embiid. 
Um, you know, and the Sixers are benefiting from it. They could have, you know, couched out and, and taken someone for a, a shorter term fix, but they didn't. And I think that's pretty uh, exemplary of Sam's, you know, basically his whole time in Philly. Uh, Michael Kasky Blomain is with us. The Sixers play, take on the Nuggets tonight. And by the way, in that draft, it was funny because remember, that was the winless for Wiggins here. Everybody thought Wiggins was really going to be the guy. And I had tweeted out the other night many people thought that the, the Timberwolves are kind of ahead of the Sixers. And I think many people might be wrong. I mean, realistically, they swept them this year, and the game they played with Butler was in Minnesota. That's an example of them, I don't want to say ditching their process, but they elected to go one way when the Sixers went a different way. The Sixers stayed a little patient and went through the draft. They decided to make a couple trades and then went out and signed or, or, or traded and got Butler. And now because of that, It'll be interesting to see how much more they can grow, Michael, because they're they're now they're out of picks and they don't have a lot of cap space. Where the Sixers are about where they are, but they still have multiple picks and all the cap space. So when you put those two teams who kind of started this together, whose side do you like better? Yeah, Mike, absolutely. And I don't I don't even think that this is just being from a you know a Philadelphia media member perspective. The Sixers are just are set up better. You know, long term and short term, like you said, they added Jimmy Butler, but that's been, you know, kind of to the negative of one of their young building blocks in Wiggins, who's now, you know, clearly the third option on that team. He's expressed, you know, frustration with his role. Uh, you know, Carl Towns is, is good. I think we would all agree that Joel is better. I think we'd all agree that Ben Simmons is better than Wiggins. And the team is much deeper. You know, uh, Thibodeau runs the, the system that doesn't go you know, very deep. They don't have a lot of young talent other than, than Wiggins and Butler. Like you said, they brought in basically the, the 2012 Chicago Bulls team, to, you know, to complement those guys, Rose, uh, Butler, Gibson. And then, uh, like you said, they're, they're, they don't have the picks. They don't have the cap space because a lot of that's tied up in an, uh, an injured Jimmy Butler now. So, I mean, they're certainly a, an attractive team. I'm not trying to take anything away from Minnesota. I do think they've, they've put themselves in a good position. But honestly, Moving forward, there's not, you know, other than maybe the Warriors who have their their superstars locked up, there's not a lot of teams in the NBA that I think you would want to trade, you know, the, the position that the Sixers are in with at this point. Michael, did you see the stat about the Sixers starting five and their point differential where they're Embiid, Simmons, Sarish, Redick, and Covington are plus 240? The next closest team is OKC. I mean, what does that talk about? A, their starting five, and B, uh, their ability to uh, share the basketball. Yeah, Pete, I did see that. And it's been all, all year that the Sixers starting five has been extremely impressive. They, uh, You know, earlier in the season, the bench was the reason a lot of times the leads got blown, that, uh, you know, some of the losses happened because the team just wasn't as deep uh, as it needed to be in terms of productivity. They've obviously taken a big step up uh, in, in that regard with Ilya Sova and Marco Bellinelli. But the most interesting thing to me in terms of that is, is actually looking into the future a little bit. You have, you know, what's been the best starting five in the NBA all season, and you're taking that into an off season where you are expected to be a major player in free agency and have a lot of money, but you already have, you know, what, what's the best starting five in the NBA. So I think it'll be really interesting to see how Brian Colangelo kind of decides to build upon, you know, this, this unit that showed itself to be, you know, one of the league's best. Uh, at this stage, Michael, what are you doing? Are you going for the three seed, or are you more concerned about resting than Bede and Simmons because, uh, you know, the, 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 these guys have played more basketball than ever. Now, the Embiid thing, you know, we say, well, he missed two years. What do you need to rest him for? But you got to be cognizant a little bit because he was wearing down a little bit there. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that he missed three years, it's not like the rest is cumulative. It's, it's not, you know, he, he would is certainly the most basketball he's played in a season in his career up to right now. Um, so with Joel, I've actually been surprised at how much he's played over the recent stretch. I thought, like you mentioned, I think there was a, you know, a time there where he was looking pretty fatigued on the floor uh, for a few games. I thought maybe he would get a night off. He hasn't. He's been, uh, you know, playing really well. Luckily, he got to take a, a couple fourth quarters off recently. I think, you know what, by default, Mike, I think they're going to get the three seed. I really do, just based off the schedule that they have and the schedule that the, the Cavaliers have for the rest of the season. I do think that that three seed is, uh, you know, really something that's in range. I don't know if it's necessarily something that is a goal for them. But, uh, you know, either way, you're going to end up playing one of the one of the teams that we talked about before, the Pacers, the Wizards, 
uh, maybe the Bucks if they make a surge. And I think you know having home court is the main thing. Whether you're you, you're at the three spot or the, the four spot, um, you know you've been down to Wells Fargo this season. It's been it's been an awesome place to watch basketball all year long. I think uh, you know the fans have really Michael, really... Michael, Michael, Michael. We got breaking news by the way. Yeah. Uh, it looks like Markel Fultz will play tonight. Yeah. Yeah, I'm seeing that too. Okay. There we go. There you go. So that I figure uh, that was worth uh, cutting you off there for a second. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> Mike. Uh, you know, Mike, that that comes as a surprise to me. To be honest, I did not expect to see Markel. Well, uh, when James season. Young just got released about a, a little while ago, I got that email, and I'm thinking, all right, if James Young gets released, then what? And it's because Markel Fultz going to play. So there you go. So all the people who are wondering about him, that'll be interesting. How much have you seen of Fultz? I've seen a good amount. Like he's been, he's been in in the in the eye before games. Uh, you know, I've been I've been down in the center early. He's been, uh, you know, getting a lot of shots up. He's been putting on, um, you know, a pretty not not a display necessarily, but he's looked good. I mean, physically, he's he's looked ready to play to me for at least a month. Uh, the shots look better. It was honestly just more a matter of timing. It's so late in the season. The team has been playing so well. Uh, you know, they've kind of found the rhythm that they're in with the bench. I just thought that it would be. You know, a matter of patience, they bring him back next year. But now, you know, I'm extremely excited, obviously, to see how he fits into this team. Well, Brett Brown, we had him on the show on Friday, and Mike asked him point blank, would you play Fultz if he was available? And Brett Brown, single answer, yes. Yes, I would. And Mike said playoffs, and Brett Brown, yes. They were short answers, but now he's available. He's going to play. Unbelievable. There you go. Yep, some breaking news. Markel Fultz will, I don't want to say make his debut because he has played, but he will play tonight for the Sixers. Uh, and as Michael said, you know, Michael, at the beginning of this year, I said the ceiling for this team I thought was the number three seed, and that was based on the fact that Cleveland and Boston were clearly one and two. We thought Toronto was kind of in that, you know, no man's land situation. They've been way better than we thought. Now it's Cleveland that's been the team that we didn't think is as good as they thought, but I thought three was the ceiling for this team, and a lot of it was based on you went from 10 to 29 with just Joel Embiid really – um, you know, being added to the roster. And then this year you add Ben Simmons, and I thought Markel Fultz would take you from 29 to about 45. Um, no Fultz. I can't – I mean, next year you're going to be looking at a team that I think a lot of people are going to think are going to be in that 55-win range potentially. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. We're going to be seeing a lot of top three projected finishes for the Sixers in the East next season, uh, you know, obviously depending on what happens with LeBron and where he goes. But, uh, you know, I think this it's it's pretty great that Fultz is going to – if he is coming back, we got about 10 games left in this regular season to kind of get him a, a little bit of experience. And then, you know, if, if he can be a guy that can come in off this bench and contribute, you know, in, in the teens per game and give them some offense, he could really be, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say a secret weapon, but this is, uh, you know, a development for this team that could really be a, an advantage to them in the postseason. All right, uh, Michael Kasky, Blow Maine, follow him. You, uh, you'll be there tonight? Yeah, absolutely. And this just turned into a to a must must watch game. All right, uh, follow him on Twitter at the real Mike KB. Michael, thanks, pal. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right.